Hi there. Thus far in our discussions and readings and in video lectures, we've established the following things about beliefs. We noted that all other things being equal, true beliefs are better than false beliefs. But what if we're uncertain? What if we don't know what the truth is? How do we know which beliefs are the good ones, which ones are the bad ones, which ones are better than others? Well, we discussed how Offering justification with good reason can act as a proxy for truth in those sorts of circumstances. Um, what we're talking about here is reasonable support for beliefs. Uh, if a certain belief has reasonable support and another one doesn't have reasonable support, or if the reasons are better for one belief than for some contrary belief, then that's the one that's to be rationally preferred. Rationally preferred, meaning it has good reasons. That's what rationality means. It has to do with reason. We also discussed how consistency amongst our beliefs is desirable. Uh, we don't want to have any beliefs that are in direct conflict with one another because mutually contradictory beliefs can't both be true at the same time and in the same respect. This much set us on this course of looking at um, the, the giving and evaluation of arguments as this kind of process by which we try to determine which beliefs are the ones that are rationally preferable to other beliefs. That there's some sort of activity that needs to happen, a critical process. In today's video lecture, we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into this question of um, what sorts of habits or virtues we want to pursue when we're thinking about uh, how it is that we come to our beliefs. And we're also going to start turning our attention towards this social dimension that was mentioned in the first video lecture, this social dimension of critical thinking by which we're kind of giving and listening to and evaluating and reconstructing arguments with other people. In fact, frequently the way that this is going to play out and the way that we examine arguments with other people is going to be in circumstances where we disagree with the people that we're looking at arguments with. So we're going to talk about um, some etiquette and some sort of like virtuous habits in thinking about arguments as it concerns critical discussion with other people. This is by no means exhaustive of this topic. It's actually the sort of thing that you could write, you know, very long books about. Um, but hopefully it's enough to kind of get us focused on the right sort of attitude to bring to um, some sort of discussion, a critical discussion, where I'm trying to d establish what the truth is with other people, perhaps some people that have different opinions than I do. It's also probably worth noting that we're going to be taking a particular kind of approach to talking about um, what it is that uh, Shea and Nuccitelli refer to as virtues of belief, what I'm talking about in terms of etiquette and virtuous, uh, virtuous argument. And that technique uses what's usually referred to as a virtue approach. And that approach involves the identification of two undesirable extremes, um, which we can avoid by trying to carve out some sort of middle path, some virtuous mean between those two extremes. For example, one of the virtues of belief that Shea and Nuccitelli talk about involves trying to find some sort of balance between two principles, a principle of conservatism and a principle of revisability, both of which seem to be uh, some sorts of principles that we're trying to adhere to in order to make sure that we're coming to beliefs in the right sort of way. Principle of conservatism tells us that if a belief has a reliable track record, then I should be hesitant to abandon it. Shane and Uchitelli actually give a really interesting example here. They say, uh, suppose that you've been studying neuroscience and you have some kind of, you've taken like anatomy and physiology classes and you have some sort of idea of how it is that somebody is able to have the idea to wiggle their toe and then they wiggle their toe. If my idea of how toe wiggling happens is that some sort of um, electrical signal gets sent from the brain down a chain of neurons to uh, some neurons in the toe, which then kind of like activate some muscles which will contract and then relax, and that's the toe wiggling, then perhaps it would be surprising to go to some sort of show where somebody gets sawed in half, and after they get sawed in half, the head and the feet are brought to opposite sides of the stage, and we talk to the head and we say, please wiggle your toes, and then down on the opposite side of the stage, the person wiggle their, wiggles their toes. Now, we could take that as evidence that we should change our belief about how it is that toe wiggling happens, that um, in this show we've been given some pretty compelling contrary evidence to the prevailing theory of toe wiggling. But it seems a little bit silly to do that, to abandon the belief so quickly and so casually. Um, perhaps the better move here is to suspect that some kind of illusion was employed in this show in order to make it look as if somebody was cut in half when in fact they weren't actually cut in half. 
Uh, there are probably some other reasons why I would think that a person doesn't actually get sawed in half in a show. This principle of conservatism seems aimed at trying to get us to not be too flighty when it comes to changing our beliefs, that once we identify something that has a good track record, some, a set of beliefs that is working, um, we should want to stick to it. It should have some sort of preferred edge there. At the same time, there's this principle of revisability that says, if I'm presented with good reasons to abandon belief, I totally should change my mind. So obviously, there are excesses on either side here. I could be too conservative. I could be the sort of person that um, thinks that somehow it demonstrates integrity, that I never change my beliefs about anything at all. And that seems to be a little too close-minded. It seems to be dogmatic. So perhaps this is one of the extremes that we're worried about. A vicious extreme is the extreme of dogmatism, this kind of close-mindedness by which you don't change your beliefs ever, and you never really seriously consider the possibility that you might change your beliefs. At the same time, we have another vicious extreme on the other side. You don't want to be so open-minded that your brains fall out of your head and you don't have any real beliefs at all, or you're constantly changing your beliefs from one moment to the other. Your beliefs aren't going to be very helpful if you take that sort of extreme approach. So the virtuous mean here involves trying to find a path between dogmatism and this sort of extreme relativism by which we don't actually ever take any kind of real position. We just constantly fall back into this like, well, I guess everybody's entitled to their own opinion, whatever that opinion might be sort of attitude. And we can talk about trying to find that virtuous mean by talking about balancing these two principles, the principle of conservatism and the principle of revisability. Now, when I portray it like that, it perhaps seems a little bit obvious, um, but at the same time, I think most of us would probably identify that um, we probably do miss that virtuous mean, and we probably miss it more often on one side than we do on another. This is actually a real practical benefit to taking a virtue approach. It's kind of difficult to prescribe in the abstract exactly where that balance between conservatism and revisability lies, exactly where that virtuous mean between the excesses of dogmatism and extreme flightiness or extreme relativism. It's kind of difficult to tell where that is, but we probably have some sense of whether or not we're erring on one side rather than the other. Um, for my part, um, I don't know about you, I have a tendency to kind of like err too much on the side of dogmatism than extreme relativism. I have a tendency to perhaps be a little too close-minded with the beliefs that I'm already comfortable with. And that means that I know what I have to work on when I am try trying to think about like how do I develop better habits for thinking uh, with other people or by myself. I know that I need to make an effort to try to keep a more open mind. We can think about this in a slightly different way as well by talking about balancing courage and humility when it comes to not only having beliefs, but sharing those beliefs publicly. So, uh, for example, we want to be courageous, but we don't want to be arrogant, right? We want to have some sort of confidence in our beliefs, but again, we don't want that confidence to be um, a kind of a false confidence. We don't want to kind of overreach how well justified our beliefs actually are. So we can probably say something like, uh, well, you don't want to be so afraid to speak up. You don't want to be so humble that you never say what you think is true. You never actually take a position on something, because sometimes a position needs to be taken. But at the same time, we probably shouldn't be so foolish or so reckless as to think that once we've shared our opinion that that's the end of the intellectual process, rather than just the beginning of an intellectual process. I need to be genuinely open to the prospect that in some sort of a disagreement, I might be the one who's wrong, but I don't want to be you know, uh, so lacking in confidence that I never think that, I'm, like even when my reasons are clearly better than the reasons of people taking the contrary position, um, that like I shouldn't have some sort of confidence to take the position that I do take. And I want to be critically aware enough of the reasons for why I believe what I believe that I can kind of measure my confidence. Confidence doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. I can say I'm more or less confident in a way that's kind of proportional to the quality of reasoning, reasons that I have and the quality of reasons that are on offer for a contrary position. So here also we see two values that need to kind of be balanced against one another, or perhaps two vicious extremes that we want to avoid by finding some kind of virtuous middle path. We want to be courageous, but we don't want to be reckless. We don't want to be, uh, we want to be humble, but we don't want to be so fearful of sharing our opinion or um, so uncertain of ourselves that we never actually take a position. 
Yet another way of thinking about this has to do with thinking very carefully about whether or not we've appropriately designated where the burden of proof in some sort of dispute might lie. There's fairly reliable psychological evidence that people, on the whole, have a tendency to think of the default position as the one that they already agree with, and that would mean that the burden of proof is on others to move them away from that position. Um, perhaps that is an appropriate sort of attitude to take. Perhaps this is yet another way of talking about uh, the way that the principle of conservatism works, but it's probably worth pointing out that in a critical discussion, especially where we're having a discussion with people who might not agree with the position that we're already inclined to when we begin the discussion, is to say that perhaps the default position should actually be more neutral. Um, it should be a position of kind of like skeptical withholding of judgment until we've had a real clear look at the reasons and arguments that are on offer for either side. For any proposition, there are three logically possible psychological attitudes that we can have towards the truth of that proposition. You could believe it, which is to say that you think it's true. You could disbelieve it, which is to say that you think it's false. And frequently overlooked is this third option of non-belief, which isn't to say that there is no truth or falsity of the issue, but it's to say, I'm not sure what the truth is, and I'm suspending judgment. Now, as I just mentioned, in the context of critical discussion, usually that default position is non-belief, and that means that there's a burden of proof on both sides in order to demonstrate the compelling reasons for why we should either believe or disbelieve some key proposition. And while I might start out going into a critical discussion, taking a kind of a, a skeptical suspension of judgment, the goal of that critical discussion is to arrive at either a belief or disbelief of the proposition in question. However, sometimes there is a default position on some issue that isn't that kind of skeptical non-belief. Sometimes, uh, for example, in our judicial system, we identify that a person is innocent until proven guilty, which is a fairly explicit way of saying that the burden of proof in some sort of, uh, in some sort of criminal case, at least, lies upon the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused is guilty. And if it turns out that the prosecution isn't able to discharge that burden of proof, then juries are instructed to find the defendant not guilty. In those sorts of circumstances, there's a default position and the burden of proof is on disproving that default position. The burden of proof is um, on one side but not on the other. If the burden of proof is on me, I have to demonstrate that there's good reason to abandon that default position and uh, the other side, all they would have to do is show that I have not discharged that burden of proof, that I haven't given good reason to abandon that position just yet. On the other hand, if there is no default position, if the burden of proof is evenly shared on both sides of some sort of a dispute, and all I'm able to do is to show that the other side isn't making good arguments, then I haven't really made my case. All I've done is shown that like no good arguments have been made yet, and therefore we're still in this position of non-belief. We're still in this position where we have to suspend judgment because we haven't heard compelling reasons one way or the other yet. In order for me to discharge that burden of proof, I have to not only identify that the other side isn't making very compelling arguments, I have to make some sort of positive argument of my own for why the position that I'm representing is actually believable. And if you ever find yourself in a dispute where it's not clear where the burden of proof lies, it's probably worth pointing out that when it comes to this question of etiquette, engaging in critical discussion in a way that's polite, the most polite thing to do in that sort of disagreement is to act as if you have the burden of proof, or act as if I should act as if I have the burden of proof. If possible, I want to be able to make a stronger case than uh, one that's kind of built on this technicality of like, I actually already have the default position and I don't need to offer compelling positive reasons for why that position should be taken seriously. One place that we've already seen this idea of burden of proof at work, or a, kind of a failure to recognize and appropriately deal with burden of proof, is in a fallacy uh, that we saw earlier called an appeal to ignorance, or argumentum ad ignoratium. Um, in an appeal to ignorance, what we say is, we don't know, therefore this position is true, right? Uh, the example that we have here is Timmy says, of course there's intelligent alien life out there, and Tammy asks, well, why do you say that? And Timmy says, well, there's just so much that we don't know about the universe. Note that if Timmy is making an argument at all here, he's not making an argument for why we should think that there is intelligent alien life out there. He's making an argument for why we can't be confident that there isn't 
intelligent alien life out there. And all that really does is get us to this default position of like, okay, well then we don't know, right? No positive argument is being offered for why I should find it believable that there is intelligent alien life. Instead, I'm just being given reasons to be suspicious of an argument that tries to come to the conclusion that there is no intelligent alien life. And so the big mistake that this fallacy commits is by mistaking an argument that gets us to that kind of neutral skeptical position of non-belief for one that gets me to um, some sort of positive position. It's a mistake that says, just because I've shown that you haven't made a very compelling argument for this position, therefore the opposite position may be true, and we're like, no, 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 no. All we've really shown there is that like, we don't know. We've also seen the same principle at work in the fallacy fallacy, which identifies just because an argument is fallacious or just because an argument isn't good, that doesn't mean that its conclusion is false. And we've also seen this in another principle, uh, which is that uh, while a good argument tells me that there's good reason to believe its conclusion, a bad argument just doesn't give me good reason to believe its conclusion. It doesn't give me reason to disbelieve the conclusion. It only says there's no good reason to believe. And so again, the default is back to non-belief. So that fallacy fallacy makes the mistake of saying just because somebody's given a bad argument, therefore their position must be false. And we're like, no, 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 no. If they make a bad argument, then we've been giving nothing interesting. We're still at this default position, which is generally in critical discussion, non-belief. This starts to bring up questions uh, not only of the sort of psychological attitudes and kind of habits of thought that I should personally have when I'm thinking by myself or when I'm thinking with other people, but how it is that I should interact with other people. So this negotiation of burden of proof, for example, is the sort of thing that I might have to work out in a critical discussion with another person, a person who might not agree with me. And that's perhaps why we might say that the polite thing to do is to take on the burden of proof yourself. We can also ask questions about how it is that we should be interpreting other people's arguments. When I'm involved in a critical discussion and somebody's offering me a reasoned argument for a position that perhaps I agree with, perhaps I don't agree with, how ought I interpret that argument? This interpretive dimension is unavoidable for a variety of reasons, one of which is a kind of inherent vagueness and ambiguity of natural language, and the other of which is this way in which, in casual conversation, few of us speak with the kind of precision and rigor that's required for uh, you know, a really rigorous critical analysis. This has popped up a couple of times in reading assignments where we've talked about trying to reconstruct arguments, um, particularly when the arguments are missing key premises or perhaps even missing a conclusion, when we have what are known as arguments that are enthymemes. So I oftentimes will have to reconstruct an argument that's given to me by somebody else. What sorts of principles should I bring to that kind of interpretive reconstructive process? The big principle that deals with this question is what's known as the principle of charity. And the principle of charity says, whenever you're involved in critical discussion with somebody else, and perhaps in any kind of discursive context, you should always interpret other people's arguments or the claims that other people make in the best possible light. We want to make sure that we interpret their premises in such a way that we maximize the truth of those premises. If there's an option for interpretation and one of them involves an interpretation where a key premise is gonna be false and another interpretation of that premise would have it be true, I should take the option where I interpret it such that it would be true rather than false. Likewise, we're trying to interpret that support structure, that relationship between the premises and the conclusion that um, this person that I'm involved in critical discussion with is trying to articulate. Um, how should I interpret that? Well, I should interpret it in such a way that that argument is as strong as possible. Not just interpret the premises in such a way that they're true, but interpret the relationship between the premises and conclusion in a way that makes that argument as strong as I possibly could make it. This principle of charity gives us a way to avoid committing a fallacy that we've already seen, the straw man fallacy. That straw man fallacy we discussed as a a fallacy of relevance, and I'm committing a straw man fallacy whenever I artificially weaken somebody's position by portraying it in a way that is, you know, worse than it actually is. And perhaps if we have a principle that says we shouldn't artificially weaken somebody's position, that principle of charity that says, like, make sure that you interpret somebody's argument in the best possible light, we also might want to have a principle that uh, warns us off against artificially strengthening somebody's position. Now this is a little bit delicate. Um, the, this is usually captured in what's known as a principle of faithfulness, which says to always interpret other people's arguments in as accurate 
a way as possible. Not necessarily the best possible light, in an accurate way, so actually represent what it is that they're trying to say. And this raises a question of whether or not there's some kind of companion fallacy to the straw man fallacy. Uh, we might call it a steel man fallacy, whereby I'm representing somebody's argument as stronger than it actually is. Now this balance is really difficult to strike, and as we mentioned before, um, and that this is kind of typical of a virtue approach, it's difficult to kind of abstractly prescribe where that balance is going to lie. It's really hard to give kind of universal rules to follow to make sure that you are balancing charity and faithfulness. But you might have some sense of um, which side of these two vicious extremes that are trying to be avoided, a straw man fallacy and a steel man fallacy, which of those are you kind of more inclined to fall prey to, which of those might be worse. And uh, my sense is not only for myself, but for most people that I've engaged in critical discussion with, um, we have more difficulty applying that principle of charity than we do a principle of faithfulness. We have a tendency to represent the arguments that are being made by people who disagree with us as artificially weaker, and we rarely end up finding ourselves in a situation where we're interpreting them in a kind of artificially strong way. And this brings us to kind of like an overarching principle or an overarching point that needs to be made when we're talking about etiquette and virtuous argument or, or kind of like virtues of engaging in critical discussion. And this involves making a distinction between critical discussion and debate. In a debate, there's a winner or a loser. And perhaps you don't really care whether the side that you're representing is true. You're kind of usually in a debate, you're assigned a side and you just want to represent that as well as possible so that you can win the debate so that like your side comes out on top. But the goal of critical discussion is not to win. And in fact, it's perhaps toxic to think of critical discussion as the sort of thing where there are winners and losers. The goal is uh, perhaps one where everybody wins. The goal is to find the truth. And if everybody gets that, then it's hard to see how, how anybody is losing. We need to make sure that when we come to a critical discussion with somebody who we disagree with, that we don't think of them as an enemy. We don't think of them as an opponent. They're an interlocutor. They're a partner in this kind of activity by which we're trying to uncover the truth, or failing that, we're trying to uncover what the best available reasons for believing one position versus another are. And a key principle that we can apply to make sure that we're doing that is to make sure that we define our terms or we use premises in such a way that our quote-unquote opponents, the people who disagree with us, are going to find those premises and find those terms appealing. They're not going to be inclined to kind of dismiss them out of hand. We discussed this previously when we talked about begging the question. If I'm defining my terms in ways that uh, people who disagree with me are not going to be inclined to accept, or if I'm using premises that people who disagree with me are not going to be inclined to, ex to accept, then I'm not really offering any sort of compelling reasons that are going to have a chance at changing their mind. The closer we can keep this to a friendly discussion rather than a debate or a fight, the easier it's going to be to be able to maintain that sort of principle. So again, while this isn't really intended to be a comprehensive account of like how to be polite, how to, you know, what sorts of rules of etiquette um, are required for a productive critical discussion, it hopefully gives us some idea, an idea that's already been coming together in previous discussions and lectures, um, but hopefully we've got some kind of some key concepts to, to clarify those intuitions that are starting to bubble up to the surface. We discussed how we need to manage some sort of balance between a principle of conservatism and a principle of revisability so that we can avoid the vicious extremes of being dogmatically closed-minded and so, um, so flighty or so open-minded that we're not actually taking a position, which is, after all, the goal of critical discussion, which is to, to come to some sort of like well-reasoned conclusion. We talked about this in a slightly different way in terms of balancing courage and humility, that we want to avoid arrogance, but we also want to avoid false modesty. Um, it's important to be able to speak your mind, to like have confidence in a position, but that confidence should be proportional to the, avail to the available evidence. And if we're engaging in a critical discussion, we should recognize that when we put forth our opinion and try to support it, that this is the beginning of an intellectual process, not the end of an intellectual process. We discussed how balancing the principle of charity and faithfulness is key in the interpretation and reconstruction of other people's arguments, and we introduced this concept of the burden of proof, which has to do with 
what the default position is in a critical discussion with respect to um, the possible psychological attitudes that we can take towards the truth of a proposition, uh, belief, disbelief, and non-belief, and how more often than not in a critical discussion, particularly when the truth of some kind of crucial claim is up for grabs, that default position is non-belief. It's that skeptical suspension of judgment, which means both sides ought to have that burden of proof. Both sides have to offer positive arguments for why their position should be taken seriously and can't just get away with criticizing the arguments that are being made by the other side. And lastly and most importantly, we have this notion that we shouldn't be thinking of our interlocutors as opponents or enemies. We should be thinking of them in as friendly a terms as possible. We should be engaging in critical discussion in as friendly a way as possible by thinking of our interlocutors as our partners in this activity rather than as our opponents. And this isn't just good manners. This isn't just good etiquette. It's not just being polite. This is what makes critical discussion productive. It's what makes critical discussion work and satisfy the goals that it's trying to achieve. And we have to be mindful of these principles because it takes effort to apply them. It takes effort to adhere to them. In an upcoming lesson, we'll discuss the implicit psychological biases that we all have that lead us astray from these principles and cause us to drift into the vicious excesses that we're actually trying to avoid by employing these principles. I look forward to seeing you for that video lecture, and until then, take care.